Humankind has been stockpiling food and other essential items since ancient times. This is evidenced through the discovered food preservation and storage practices of many ancient cultures throughout the world. In ancient times, the practice of drying or dehydrating of food using the sun or wind, or even fire was used. Then later, the curing of food using salt to dry it, was meant to preserve food so that it could be stored for longer durations and stockpiled for bad times. In some climates that were exposed to freezing temperatures, food was preserved by burying it under ice and snow so that it could last beyond winter. Fermenting and pickling of food, as well as sugaring of food as a form of preservation was also practiced. In the modern era, canning of food as a form of preservation became commonplace. So, recognizing that the original intention of food preservation was for purposes of survival, the concept of stockpiling, is actually nothing new. However, nowadays most people who do not know better, including the mainstream media, are quick to label survival stockpiling as hoarding, when instead, the context of each is entirely different even though the words may be synonymous. Hoarding can be a compulsive behavioral problem where a person accumulates items over time which then becomes clutter or junk, occupying almost every available space in their home. From an economic perspective, hoarding can mean holding back on a resource to create artificial scarcity so as to create a supply and demand advantage for profit. Survival stockpiling, on the other hand, is a deliberate and planned intention with a defined objective in mind. That objective is simple. What you are doing is stockpiling of the essential goods necessary for your survival, not out of fear, but in anticipation of a threat or risk materializing. You are in fact, building a reserve for future use. By now, you understand that urban emergency preparedness is not about you going off-grid. Instead, it is preparing yourself for a situation when all the normal conveniences that you were used to suddenly ceases or fails because of some extraordinary event or incident. History has shown that no matter your stature, where you live, how much money you have in the bank, or how high your fence is, that any rapid onset of a crisis, whether a natural disaster, contagious disease, a human-induced disaster, or the sudden and complete breakdown of law and order, that normality can be brought to a sudden and unannounced stop, which, may either cause you to shelter in place or to bug out. In a disaster or crisis, where basic commodities are suddenly in short supply or even rationed, people who were unprepared for such a situation, become desperate. This desperation becomes the driver for even more desperate and impulsive new actions, which, often have adverse and even life-threatening consequences. If you threw away half-eaten food in normal times, you may now find yourself eating that last crumb as if it was your last meal. If you were a gentle soul in normal times, now that you have less food or no food, you may easily find yourself becoming an aggressor, who will easily discard your moral conscience for the sake of your family's survival. On the other hand, if you were indeed prepared and had built up a decent survival stockpile, you will also realize that, during such a crisis, you will also change. Whereas you may have been altruistic and kind in normal times, you may now suddenly find yourself becoming the most selfish and ruthless person for the sake of protecting your stockpile from the grasp of others. As a prepper, when it comes to stockpiling of essential resources, what you store, and, how you store these resources is of the utmost importance. In keeping with the rules of three, the underlying principle of survival stockpiling is that, once a risk has materialized, your vulnerability level should be able to withstand the immediate, and, subsequent impact based on your level of preparedness. Before I get to the basics of what you should have in your survival stockpile, the location of where you store and maintain this stockpile is very important. Firstly, your survival stockpile must be kept separate from your regular consumption items, otherwise, you run the risk of dipping into your stockpile, and, before you realize it, you could, deplete it. Then, you will also need to factor in that, you should separate your food, water, and other nourishment items from your non-food items. There will obviously be underlying factors that determine the stockpile storage location. These underlying factors will include family size, available space, and possibly financial constraints. However, the one factor that you must consider, is time. Your survival stockpile must be targeted to last you at least six months, that is, your stockpile location must have sufficient space to accommodate a volume of essential items that should last you six months at the very least. Whether you choose a standalone room, or an outbuilding, or even erect a shed for this purpose, there are some principles that must be considered when choosing the stockpile storage location. The storage location for your food stockpile should be kept dry, cool, and not near any object or source that will create random room temperature fluctuations, that is, unpredictable increase or reduction in room temperature. 
Ideally, the ambient temperature of your food storage location should be maintained at comfortable room temperature, that is, between 20 and 25 degrees Celsius. Whether you will store your food supplies on shelves, or in storage boxes, the storage area should not be exposed to direct sunlight, as this may accelerate spoilage of both the food and its packaging. The location should also be well ventilated to prevent moisture deterioration of food or its packaging material. You also need to manage the storage space for any intruders. These intruders could be rodents, crawling or flying insects, and even those nosy neighbors, who in a crisis, could become your stockpile's greatest threat. Simply put, keep your stockpile and its location a secret from both neighbors and vermin alike. Remember, your stockpile is your investment in you and your family's survival, and you should ensure that the location is made and kept as secure as possible, both in terms of natural threats, and human threats. A non-food storage location is equally important. The storage of stockpiled non-food items should not be close to your food and drinking water stockpile. This is to protect your food items from absorbing any odors or other vapors that may be given off by non-food items. Just as you would normally keep your personal hygiene products away from your household hygiene and cleaning products, you need to separate the non-food stockpile. If, however, you have limited space, and have no choice but to store your food and non-food items in the same space, then ensure that your non-food items are stored in proper sealable storage boxes. Unless you can afford a dehumidifier to manage moisture in your stockpile location, one cost-effective way of doing this is by creating your own moisture control tool. One of these tools can be found in the pet aisle of your local supermarket or at your local veterinary. Yes, I did say, pet aisle and local vet. This tool is cat litter. Cat litter that has silicon dioxide as its key ingredient, has the same stuff that you find inside those little white packets that you see when opening the packaging of something new you that you bought. These white packets are called desiccants with the stamped, do not eat, across it, and, contains the same silicon dioxide or silica as found in cat litter. However, look only for cat litter that contains silicon dioxide as its ingredient. The good ones also have odor control crystals. You can place the litter in small containers and distribute these containers within your storage location. From time to time, place these containers in the sun for any moisture that was absorbed to evaporate. With the same cat litter, you could easily make your own desiccant packets to place inside your storage containers. Buy a box or two of cheap tea bags. Cut each tea bag halfway along one edge, ditch the tea leaves inside, and use a teaspoon to fill each bag with two or three teaspoons of cat litter silica. Then fold the cut edge and seal it with a glue stick. There, you have now made your own stock of desiccant. In the next video, I will go into greater detail into the basics of what you should have in your survival stockpile, and in some cases, explain the maths and science behind certain stockpile items. But, as I said in the beginning of this video, your stockpile location is just as important as the stockpile itself. If you already have a survival stockpile, review its setup and location. If you are just starting out, choose the location wisely. Either way, remember, your stockpile is your Fort Knox. Keep the nosy neighbor away from it. Subscribe to the South African Prepper. Like and share our videos to other South Africans since we are all in this together. Here you get real information and fact-based insights. We don't do opinion or BS. Preparedness is not a hobby, it is a way of life that could save your life.